So today I'll be talking about long-term analysis of fatty acids, get into that definition a little bit more in a second, and clipping content of major crayfish from Lake Ontario. And so I want to start off by thanking uh, co-authors here. We have Brian Wydell uh, from USGS, Mike Connerton from New York State DEC, and also Dr. Jacques Richard. And this being a long-term project, there are a lot of other people who should be thanked. Um, both from USGS and DEC for their help with fish collections, multiple undergraduate and graduate students from the lab of Dr. Jacques Richard at the College of Brockport, and then there's also been funding provided through the Brockport Foundation. So starting off with what are fatty acids? And so essentially a fatty acid is the constituent of a lipid, so lipids being that organic macromolecule that makes up the fats and oils and other compounds that are in our bodies. And they're conservatively transferred from a predator to a predator. So just like when you're eating your fish oils, when you consume that fish oil, those fatty acids, your omega-3s, omega-6s, those are going to be transferred into your own fatty acid profile. And so here are a few different examples of fatty acids. And you can see um, the long chains. Those are carbon chains. And the number of carbons in each fatty acid can vary. And then also you'll see these two lines in some of these fatty acids, and those double lines represent double bonds, and the number of double bonds and also the locations in that carbon chain can vary as well. And so you get a lot of different fatty acids because of that. So to give an idea of how fatty acids move throughout a food chain, uh, you start with fatty acids in benthos or pelagic regions, some examples being palmitoleic acid, uh, 16, 1, and 7, you can see on the bottom. On the seventh fatty acid, you have that double bond, so that's where that one and seven comes in, one being that there's only one double bond, 16 being the number of carbons in the carbon chain, and as I said, seven being where that double bond is located. And so when you have a fish that's consuming those items, then the fatty acids get transferred to those fish as well. So in the ground goby here on the left, you're seeing higher palmitoleic acid because it's being a more benthic fish, it's receiving more of those benthic fatty acids. And then in comparison, the aloe on the right here gets more oleic acid from those pelagic sources. And so what this shows us is that these two species can have limited diet overlap. And then another benefit of fatty acid analyses is that they provide long-term diet information. And so this can help you select or determine uh, spatial and temporal differences in those diets. And so in comparison to stomach content, which will only give you short period of uh, window that the fish was feeding on based on what's left in the stomach, the fatty acids can give you dietary information for periods of weeks to months. So in order to con or determine the concentrations of the fatty acids, first we take a sample of fish and we grind it under a solution that will extract the lipids from the tissue. And then we're able to quantify the lipid content based on the amount of lipids that were in the tissue. And then we can separate the fatty acids from that the lipid content, and you get a gas chromatograph like the figure here after running that sample through uh, GCMS, or gas, chromat gas chromatography mass spectrometry. And so each one of these peaks represents a relative abundance or concentration of different fatty acids. And so you can think of this kind of like as a barcode where you have these different concentrations for all the different fatty acids that are going to vary among individuals and combined they make up that unique fatty acid signature. So for this study, crayfish have been collected from Rochester, New York and Lake Ontario and the main crayfish that we look at are alewife, rainbow smelt and round goby and they were collected by New York State DEC and USGS using uh, trawls and the fish were sampled in both the fall and the spring from 2010 through 2016, so a long period. And we had a total of uh, about 1,600 fish. You can see there were about 630 alewife, 450 <coughs> rainbow smelt, and then 580 round goby. And so the three species are shown there. So the first thing that we looked at was trends in lipid content. And this is just looking at the three different species across all those seasons and years. And we saw that alewife have much higher lipid content than the other two species. So lipid content being uh, index of condition. <laughs> so the higher lipid content, the higher condition, likely the more energy that you're going to have available. 
And the next one we did was we looked at yearly uh, trends for the three species and saw that there weren't, much, there weren't many differences. There was some variation among years, but no trends were visible. And then lastly, we looked at seasonal variation. And here you can see that in the spring, there is generally lower fat or lipid content for alewife and rainbow smelt, but in round goby, there's the opposite. So if you were at uh, Brown and Fidel's talk earlier today in the plenary talk, you might uh, remember that he was talking about how alewife were moving from the upper pelagic water to more benthic areas during the winter. And so what we might be seeing here is that in the spring, that's following that winter period where these fish are going to have uh, potentially uh, lower, metabolism, lower metabolism, they might be feeding less due to the colder water, and because of that, their lipid content may be lower. And this is also showing that there's differences potentially in the diets of these species based on the season because their lipid content varies as well. So next we're looking at the fatty acid signatures of the individual prey fish. And so what the figure on the left here is essentially an ordinary <coughs> plot and each individual point represents the fatty acid signature of one individual fish. And so that point represents the concentrations of 24 different fatty acids. And then the distance between the points represents their similarity. So you can see here there's a, these three groups that are forming pretty well, being the alewife, rainbow smelt, and round goby. And we found that the largest difference was between round goby and alewife uh, with a average dissimilarity of almost 22% based on the concentration of those fatty acids. And the most similar were the rainbow smelt and alloy. And you can see that those overlap the most, but still had almost 18% dissimilarity. So the next thing that we did was we looked at the fatty acids that were responsible for those differences. And so this is a principal component analysis, and it shows which fatty acids are driving those differences. And so using five fatty acids shown on the axis here, we were able to identify 50% of that dissimilarity among the species. And so you can see fatty acids like 16, 1, and 7 here are more abundant in your benthic fish, like the goby. And then in comparison, you have fatty acids like 18, 1, and 9 that are more abundant in alewife and rainbow smell. So now that we know that there's variation among the three species, we want to look at variation that might be occurring annually. So the study was conducted from 2010 through 2016, and you can see there's a lot of overlap here. So really, there's not much annual variation. So these guys are, over the years, feeding on similar things. Uh, you can still see that there's that differentiation of two groups, being the goby and uh, rainbow smell and alewife. But points are all over the place for the different years, so no, or very limited yearly variation. Next, we looked at seasonal variation between spring and fall. So if you remember from lipid content, there were variations in those concentrations. And we found that all the species have trends in their uh, seasonal diets, although those trends don't have much power. But you can see on the figure here, specifically for uh, around goby, there are some differentiation. So if you look at the three species individually, you can see those separation a little bit more clearly. So you have the fall seasons in the green and spring in the blue. And another point that was interesting was the alewife and rainbow smelt had similar trends in their seasonal variation. So if you look at the figure on the left, that's just separating those two species. So you have the rainbow smelt on the top and then alewife on the bottom. But then when you avoid the differentiation between species and are just focusing on the differences in season, you see that they have similar seasonal trends. And so we were able to look at what fatty acids are driving that, and we found that 22,6N3 is driving that difference. Now 22,6N3 is generally a more pelagic fatty acid. So what might be happening here is you're seeing that the fish that were in the winter are moving out of that lower benthos area from the warmest water at that point into the more pelagic area, and now they're getting those fatty acids, that 22,6N3. And you also see that the spring diets are a little bit more diverse, and so this might be due to that period that it takes for fatty acids to transfer. So essentially, if you're feeding on one diet, it'll take about eight weeks for your fatty acid to completely resemble that diet. So during this period, during the spring period, those fish might be migrating to that more pelagic water, so they still have some signs of that benthic 
um, fatty acid in their signature. So another thing that you can use fatty acids for is to determine differences in species of diet based on the location in the system. So this is taken from Happel et al. Uh, using the same analyses that we do, and the uh, analyses were actually done in our lab, and what the study looked at was the variation at three different points in Lake Ontario, being the eastern point of Nine Mile Point, central Lake Ontario around Rochester, and then western at Thirty Mile Point, and you can see that the groups are separating by species, not their location. So this shows that throughout the lake, individual species have consistent fatty acid signatures or consistent diets. So there's a lot of different variables that can come into play with or determining a species diet. Uh, three of those factors that we looked at were the year, season, and then also location. And what the table here is showing is a discriminant analysis. So essentially, if you know what the fish is, can you predict what it's going to be uh, based on a model of what that species is, so based on its fatty acid signatures. And the thing to point out here is that based on the fatty acid signatures from 2010 to 2016, Alouette were correctly identified 98% of the time, Rainbow Smelt 99% of the time, and Round Gobi almost 100% of the time. So this shows that even with all this variability in season, the year, location, we're still able to correctly identify the species based on their fatty acids. And also, if you remember from before, the most similar species were alewife and rainbow smelt. And you can see that only about, at a maximum, 1.5 or 1.6% of those uh, species were not correctly identified. So pretty useful technique for not only differentiating these species, but also for identifying differences based on other factors like season. So taking this one step further, once you know what fatty acids uh, designate a specific prey item, you can relate that to predator fatty acids. So this figure here shows fatty acids of a bunch of different prey fish from Lake Ontario, and also averages for those three prey fish. And one thing that you can see is that you have your alewife over here on the left, that red square, and then also on the left is Chinook salmon. So it's known that those Chinook are mainly feeding on the alloy. And so you can see there's similar uh, locations of their fatty acid signatures in this ordination. And then similarly, you have lake trout over here on the right side of the figure. And then also you have your round goby on the right side of the figure. So this can represent that the goby are being incorporated into lake trout diets more so than the other species. So it's got a lot of useful applications for not only looking at variation within species, among species, but also showing predation on prey. And so that just again shows where those three fish are located. And so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions and thank you for your time.